So this week we're discussing history and we're discussing the plays by William Shakespeare. We had to choose between Romeo and Juliet and Richard III. And Richard III has been called a hit piece. Um, William Shakespeare essentially took the historical figure, Richard III, who was a great, great grand, sorry, a great, great uncle to Elizabeth I and a great uncle to Henry VIII and turned him into a caricature. He is no longer his historical figure. He is now a creation that has been turned upside down, backwards, sideways, inside out, and has just become a tragic farce. I will trademark that, if that is not a phrase that actually exists. Um, so is Richard III, the play, a tragedy? In many ways, William Shakespeare has written Richard III as if he is a news piece on a disliked human being. Um, universally disliked, universally reviled, he is this person who, well, one, he is so ridiculous that the real person that is being written about could not have existed. So here comes the farcical elements. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. We see this a lot, even now, with certain news broadcasts. Uh, we take a hated, reviled figure. We are sort of taught not to look at them and be like, yeah, but what about... Are they really this terrible? Can this person actually exist? Or are you painting us some sort of demonic figure so that we forget about the bad aspects of the time? And keeping in mind that the Elizabethan era and the Stuart era following had both really, really great things happening. We discovered parts of the new world, part, you know, we had vegetables and crops brought over to Europe that had never been seen before. And potatoes became, of course, part of the British diet. And so did coffee and tea and hot chocolate and all these other wonderful things from various er places that we would not have thought about in earlier years. Unless, of course, we traveled, say, to India or China or had been to the New World. Uh, for example, certain gourds, such as the pumpkin. So here's a history perspective. Uh, but Richard III himself was complex. They say that there was actually a love story between him and Anne. Uh, George the brother that is also universally reviled, he's like the second villain in Richard III, um, had apparently kidnapped Anne, the woman that Richard loved, and had basically hidden her away, dressed as a maid, and Richard had rescued her with all due pomp and circumstance, and shown his love to her while she was dressed in 15th century maid's clothing, so nah. It's, it's so romantic. But also, but William Shakespeare takes the already odd Richard III, who had been born premature, who had had many issues, and been brought up in a household where people weren't exactly great, because back then, um, Wealthy parents didn't always raise their children. They would give them to other people to raise. They had nursemaids, they had special educators, etc., etc. Especially children with disabilities, which went even into the 20th century with the royal family and the child Prince John. 
so here is some history <laughs> but the char the creature that William Shakespeare brought forth the hunchback the evil scheming man who killed a once well-loved king Henry the sixth who when he was born was basically given a kingdom and had that kingdom on his little itty bitty baby shoulders and was a miracle child. He had survived. He was sickly, but he was, he's alive. Yay. He's alive. And so on and so forth. Now, in Richard III, the play, Richard III can be compared to Macbeth in a way that this man is power hungry. Richard wants everything. He is basically saying, no, no, no. This is all great and all, but you know, you're a little wackadoodle. You, you can you need help, dude. Everything is just a little bit weird. Let me sneak on in there and help you out. Do, do, do. And causing death and mayhem and destruction even before the events of Richard III a lot with Henry VI and his family. Uh, and of course, Henry's reign where one minute he's king, one minute he's not, one minute there, you know, Richard is basically taking over for him and then everyone's arguing and everyone's fighting and it's a whole, whole disaster. So, <clears throat> Richard III can be combined with the power-hungry aspects of both Lady and Lord Macbeth. George, George Duke of Clarence, the middle sibling between Richard and Edward, the king who took over after Henry VI, who was well known in real life for being literally head and shoulders above everyone else because he was well over six feet tall, which at the time would have been like me looking up at a nine foot tall man at five foot five or just a man over six feet tall. Um, everyone just being like, oh my gosh, he's glorious, isn't he? Yes. We love him. Um, and of course, George, who is just kind of, eh. He's the middle sibling. He's got grotesque ideologies. He treats people like crap. He tries to hurt others in order to get things for himself. And the plays George and the plays Richard, as opposed to historical Richard, are kind of the same person in a way. They both want things for themselves and are, are willing to turn people inside out and backwards in order to get it. And basically shake the tree and wait for the, co or the person upside down and wait for the coins to fall out of the pockets. The roles of fate and fortune are quite a lot like Macbeth's, except that you're not thinking about witchcraft here. You're not thinking about an actual f force. At fate and fortune don't actually play invisible human characters. Is free will an option? At a lot of royal families, free will... Um, seems to be something that can affect your dynasty. One person's free will and one person's decisions not to go along with what is set ahead of them and instead to go on a different path can make or break them. So, and can also cause wars and empires to fall and tumble and you have to deal with those issues 
at the same time, free will and your... In this time, in this type of place, in the play, free will tends to be... Yeah, you're free to make decisions, dude. Seriously. Go and make all the decisions you want. Go do the thing. But, like, remember that you were born to do this thing. Okay? So, you know, don't free will too hard. The play is shaped by individual choices. You have Richard, who is making his little choices to sort of play a game of human chess. Now, you go here. So, and, but does he himself have free will? Does the chess master, Richard III, have free will? Or is he just going with his dynasty, destiny, which is to be disliked, to be power mad, and to go against anything that stands in his way? Which is the major question. And sometimes people act in such ways where you're just thinking, you know what, with a few fart jokes added, you would have a little bit of a Midsummer Night's Dream. Like you can actually see Puck from a Midsummer Night's Dream pop in and be like, okay, so, no, 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 Dick, I'll just, I'll take over here. Yeah, good. All right, so you go here. It is somewhat ridiculous. The play Richard III becomes rather farcical, but also extremely tragic. People are dying. People are up in arms. You have a man hurting his wife. You have a man committing one of the major sins, which is fratricide in a way that is positively distasteful, drowning, and in alcoholic beverages which could or might actually be a little bit of a metaphor. Is he literally drowning or is he drowning because alcoholism being part and parcel of many royal families and and meeting his death. And of course you have the glorious golden boy king who is literally head and shoulders above everyone else meeting a tragic death and Richard kind of again playing human chess with his children. And could characters have acted differently? Well, yeah, George could have been less of a jerk and tried to help Ed Ed could have been a little more forceful. Hey, look, I'm king. I can literally plow people over because I am a big man. And you could have, Richard, of course, could have gotten a little bit of a chit chat from mom, Cecily, or his wife or big brother, Ed, you know, hey, listen, you, you, you can't do this stuff. Seriously, like keep it up and you are in deep trouble, buster. Would this have changed fate? Well, I mean, let's say that Richard III, the character, as opposed to Richard III, the human, actually had conversations with Ed, and Ed had basically been like, yo, what the heck? This is, this is bad. You are not acting correctly. What is wrong with you? Um, you can't do this to people. I mean, this poor lady, this poor wife of Henry VI, she is suffering. She has been working her rear end off. And yeah, she has basically been behind the scenes poking and... Look, every single one of us seems to be playing a game of human chess here. We are not allowing other people's free will. Maybe we should actually try that. And maybe this would go differently. So everyone in the, everyone in the story by William Shakespeare is basically playing human chess. Now the specific scene. I'm going to have to go back a little bit to the fold to the Folger site and 
find my specific scene again to show siblings. Let's see. And I had this and I had forgotten to send it to my laptop. So I can't just, you know, click through a few things on my phone and be like, okay, so this is how it's working. But a lot of the times, changing fate, is it possible? Is it Let's let's find the brothers in Richard the Third Act C Act Three, Scene One. Richard and Buckingham are are, tra are are in London. Prince Edward is hanging out with them. They're all. I wish I had coconuts. They're all riding into town. The Duke of York is being taken from his sanctuary where he had brought himself to a church and said, I need sanctuary. I throw myself down upon your mercy. I need a little bit of help here. Please save my life and I will do anything that you want because that was seeking sanctuary. And then the priest would take you in, you know, and be like, just whatever you do, don't act like a fool and do as we say and you'll be okay. The brothers are sent to a sanctuary. Now, here you have the babies. You have Richard III attempting to be very polite to his nephews. All the while, in the background, you have the Duke of York doing his thing. So now, Everyone's talking about the weather and the journey and they're talking. Now, if people had acted differently, like, nah, I have a feeling that Richard is up to something. I don't know what Uncle Richard is up to, but whatever it is, we should definitely not do that. We should go a completely different direction. Something is not right here. I'm so sorry. I it's been a while and I have been reading. But we should we should definitely go in another direction entirely. We should go to grandma because grandma was still alive. Cecily had survived Mama Cecily, the mother of Edward and George and Richard, lived into her nineties, so she was definitely still alive and still kicking. And the princess should have been like, Grandma, I don't know what's going on, but whatever it is, something has to give. We cannot possibly go to Uncle Richard. This is not a good thing. And here, in this scene, Richard is basically laying on the praise and telling them, yeah, everything is awesome. And... Richard actually says the words. Sweet prince, the untainted virtue of your year, the untainted virtue of your years hath not dived into the world's deceit. No more can, can you distinguish a man than of his outward show, which God he knows seldom or never jumpeth with his heart. Those uncles of your those uncles which you want were dangerous. Your grace attended to their sugared words, but looked not into the poison of their hearts. God keep you from them and from such false friends. This, this is a really, really good thing that they should have been listening to, as opposed to continuing with what would end up being a very bad idea. Hey, um, so they're, Listen, these people that you are trusting, 
bro, bro, not a good idea. These people that you are trusting are really, really getting in there and hurting you. You should definitely, definitely go a different direction. And they should have listened to that as opposed to the sugared words and the poisonous hearts. But they didn't because in this point, fate is more important. And of course, it's very difficult to hear something about people that you love and them hurting you and them dripping poison in your ear because you want to believe that no matter what, in spite of the poison in their hearts, that they're loving you, that they are, you want so much to believe that they will act differently with you. So listening to the point being made about false friends and running into danger as opposed to doing what is smart, which is getting very, very far away and not trusting the people that you are would have been a brilliant idea. The theme, what is the theme of Richard III? In Richard III, you have the same, some of the themes from last week in which we were discussing how is Shakespeare relevant to the modern era? And those themes were family, governance, fate, magic, power, justice, revenge, love, marriage, and death. Love, of course, having various applications from romantic love all the way down to the love of a friend for a friend without the romantic stuff or even with the romantical stuff. I'm sorry. So here, the themes that we see are family, one large messed up family. You see politics, there is a kingdom, there is the execution of a king, there is the illness of a king and how that affects the kingdom around him. You have power. Oh, you have so much power and you have people looking for it and attempting to get it for themselves. One big pile. This is my fate. I'm going to I'm going to win this game of thrones. Da 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 da. da. Sorry. You, is there justice? In some cases like with George after all of his terrible actions in both life and the play because these are two very different Georges just as there are two very different Richards. There's a sense of justice revenge. There is a ton of revenge. And of course, there are strategies like lying, honeyed words. You have people ingratiating themselves rather falsely, but attempting to be the guy that everyone trusts. Yo, yo, I'm your only friend, right? I'm the only one that cares for you and I love you and I only want what's best for you, but also, oops, back step. Sorry, couldn't help it. So these are the themes of Richard III, the play, not Richard III, the human, not Richard III, the history, but Richard III, the play by William Shakespeare. A lot of the stuff in Richard III, the play, seem to be, well, there's a political gamble in the Elizabethan era, in the Stuart era, saying anything nice about Richard III would have been blasphemy. It was anathema. 
you could not say these things. Like, well, you know, actually, he was kind of a, he was not actually such a bad dude. Ooh, girl, you're at least going to be sitting, you're going to at least be cooling your heels in a dungeon for a while. You're going to enjoy the hospitality of the Church of Eng the Church and your the Tower of London. You're going to be able to see the Church of I you're going to go be able to, you know, check out the Church of St. Peter in Vicula in person. Congratulations. Well done. The the tower's quite lovely. The birds the birds, my goodness, the birds are gorgeous. And the Church of St. Peter in Chains is such a lovely church. You'll love it. Man, we have so many, many, many great people going through. That would have been a really crap idea. Um, so Shakespeare, of course, had I have to be just rude enough regarding Richard the Third that yeah, yeah, you're good, you're golden. What a wonderful play. Beautiful, fantastic. Brava, brava. Bis, bis. As opposed to so there's a lot of that and a lot of fates, including William Shakespeare's would have hung in the balance. Then you have this, this, and then of course, there's just the classics. William Shakespeare, yeah. As a writer, he would definitely have wanted drama over boring aspects like real life. Why? Why would you say something like, well, Richard III was definitely a premature infant, definitely worked his little took us off to just grow and thrive in a family of very loud influences and would have wanted to ensure his place, but also to help others when you can say things like, dude, dude, he was born with teeth teeth babies with teeth dude and he had scoliosis and his ugliness was just oozing out of his pores as opposed to well i mean so i mean you want the drama and the majesty of sad drama and Th these are my thoughts on the play Richard III and not the historical Richard III or what I think of the person Richard III. Remember, look not upon the poison of people's hearts. Sweet prince, that untainted virtue of your, of your years hath not yet dived into the world's deceit. Nor more can you distinguish of a man than of his outward show which God he knows, seldom or never jumpeth with his heart. These uncles of yours, which you want, were dangerous. Your grace attended to their sugared words, but looked not upon the poison of their hearts. God keep you from them and from such false friends. And I think that that would actually be good for a lot of people. Remember that sometimes the sweetest words can come with the most vile of poisons. 